All right, welcome to the uh, Customer Success Leadership Roundtable. I'm Andrew Marks, uh, the co-founder and architect behind the Success Coaching Training Program. Thrilled to be leading this discussion on utilizing performance metrics and KPIs. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the uh, where we've empowered over 31,000 students from nearly 100 countries with our globally acclaimed Customer Success Professional Development Programs. Whether it's self-paced online learning or dynamic virtual boot camps, we've got a program that suits your team's unique needs. You can find all the details on our website, successcoaching.co, or in the chat where Ashley will provide links and any coupon codes that we're offering right now. So for newcomers, this is where real-world advice meets practicality. We invite industry experts to share their experiences, ensuring our discussions remain grounded in the everyday challenges of customer success. Regardless of the company you work for, the scope of your role, or the size of the customers your teams deal with, we aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get going. This webinar is recorded, and we will be posting a replay and transcript on our website early next week. We encourage active participation, so please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Questions with higher upvotes will receive priority during the Q&A session. For our LinkedIn Live audience, you can also post your questions directly, and they will be relayed to us. Thank you, Santana. To maintain a smooth discussion, please use the chat window exclusively for commentary while directing your questions to the Q&A window. Thank you for your engagement. In the world of customer success, you'll find plenty of smart ideas and theories. But in this series, we're all about getting real. We're here to talk practical advice, tried and true tricks, and stories from folks who live and breathe customer success every day. That's why we've got, well, we're supposed to have three awesome panelists with us today. Well, two, two of them are here. And these are people who really know their stuff. And we can't wait to hear what they've got to say. So without any more delay, let's kick things off by having our panelists introduce themselves to y'all and tell us a bit about who they are and what they do. And let's get started as usual in alphabetical order with Ariel. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, welcome to everybody here. Glad to have so many people on the uh, on the webinar. That's always great. So my name is Ariel Benzakine. I'm um, somebody with 25 years of experience leading all of the post-sale customer-facing teams at software companies. So for the last 10 years, I've been primarily focused on customer success. Um, got into customer success in a very roundabout way. I would say at Experian, we had some retention issues and I created the first customer success team corporate wide there. And since then I've taken those playbooks to, uh, to other companies and have really driven gross and net revenue retention. So really glad to be here and can't wait to see some of the questions too. Awesome, thanks Ariel. Uh, Derek, you're up. Hi, everyone. I'm Derek Hazel. I'm based up in Toronto. Like Ariel, I've been in the business for about 25 years or so, pre technologist, and then sort of moved more into customer management, which became customer success eventually as we took that view. And I think it's, you know, it's really important, this topic today. Uh, it marries a few things that are near to me, metrics, but also the management of those metrics and what we do with the information. So that's the angle that I'm going to be coming at from a lot. Uh, when you hear me talk today. But I really appreciate you all joining. Uh, I'm proud to be a level five certified CSM, thanks to uh, success coaching here. So uh, I'll put that plug in and uh, yeah, let's go. Lots to talk about. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. And Derek was not compensated for his Correct. shout out. So I, I don't even have a sticker. That. I need a sticker. You do. You, you, do. you know what? I'm going to send you a sticker for that. Okay. You get a sticker. Uh, awesome. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't know what's happened in Madison. I'm sure an emergency came up at Madison has been a uh, a guest of ours before. So uh, I'm sure something popped up that she she had to address. Uh, maybe she'll join us um, as we as we get going here. But hey, thanks for being here uh, today to discuss a topic that, quite frankly, too many CS leaders are getting wrong. Identifying and measuring KPIs that actually matter. The reality is most customer success teams are tracking vanity metrics that make them feel good but don't move the needle for the business. Churn rate, NPS, product usage, while they have their place, focusing on these in isolation is really short-sighted. What CS really needs are hard-hitting KPIs directly tied to revenue and growth. 
Anything else is just fluff. So today we're going to challenge the status quo thinking around CS metrics and explore how to select KPIs with real teeth that prove customer success value to the company's bottom line. So to start off, let me pose this question to the panelists. Why do you think so many CS teams get it wrong when it comes to selecting meaningful business impacting KPIs? Sure, I'll take that one to kick us off. So I really believe that this profession is very poorly defined. And, you know, I talked to a lot of leaders in the space. And what I found is if you ask five different customer success leaders, define what customer success means at your organization, you're likely to get five different answers. And in some cases, they'd be diametrically opposed. So we need to do a better job of defining what is customer success what is the goal of customer success in order to have the right KPIs? So I would say, you know, you see a lot of CS teams get wrapped up in things or metrics like CSAT and NPS. Well, it's been proven that those really have no uh, bearing whatsoever on revenue retention. So clients that give you bad scores stay typically just as long as clients that give you good scores. So we shouldn't be focusing on those things. Um, Lots of other things that we focus on, like support tickets, client support tickets. Um, even I would say adoption metrics are not necessarily the KPIs that we should be looking at because they have uh, tenuous correlation to retention. So ultimately, why do we do what we do? It's to have good gross and net revenue retention. So what are the KPIs that roll into that? And I guess that's what we're going to be talking about here today. But Derek, I'm sure you have some. Yeah, Derek, what is your, what's your take on this? You know, a lot of what you said, I think, rings true for me as well. Customer success has wavered, I think, often between project management. Is it a support function? Is it a sales function? And so, you know, while customer success plays a really critical role in all those areas, uh, I think there's a credibility aspect that comes with the role that may suffer because there's uh, perhaps a perception of lack of focus in any one of those things. And what tends to happen in my uh, experience has been when you come into a CSAT environment that already has processes in place, the company believes the customers are good and how they feel about the product and the service is that it's tough to influence it. So to answer the direct question, why do we sometimes get it wrong? It's because we're not stepping out front as customer success professionals and taking the lead on establishing what the questions are in the first place. We're typically coming into established practices and processes and trying to help influence that in some direction. Which isn't all that uh, surprising given that absolutely the natural in inclination of people in these types of roles to be like, okay, how do I help? Right. Well, well no, we need, we need to help, but we also need to lead, right? We need to lead and we need to, we need to educate. So what are some of the KPIs speaking of education? What, do you, what are some of the KPIs that you believe are, are often overlooked or undervalued by CS teams, but have a significant impact on business outcomes? So I would say the most important thing, if and if we think about some of the research that's been done here by Greg Danes in particular, but um, customers stay because they get results, right? So the research shows that just the act of measuring customer results, even if the results are bad, causes customers to stay 2.1 times as long as if you don't measure customer results. If the results are good, customers stay, stay 6.3 times as long. So we need to have KPIs around customer results. And how do we measure customer results? Well, we do it in success plans, right? We jointly develop success plans with our clients. We understand what their desired outcomes are. And I would say, by the way, Success Hacker has probably the best uh, success plan template out there. I've stolen it and used it in uh, many companies now. Um, but, you know, one of the KPIs that I hold my teams accountable for is what percentage of the customer results that you're measuring, what percentage were good, right? What percentage were not good? What percentage exceeded expectations? And setting some metrics around that and tracking it over time will drive your retention up, guaranteed. Okay. That's, that's, that's a great, that's a great call out. Derek, what do you got to add to that? 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a really important point too that customer success measurement, all the metrics, uh, I'll say, is kind of a general statement, should also have continual improvement applied to it. All right. So when we're selecting the right measurements, sometimes we do have to take guesses at what we think are going to predict customer outcomes, but we have to go back and measure whether those have been effective and you know sort of move those along over time. One thing that I think has been the most critical predictor of customer intent has been something called customer effort scoring. And this is something that was introduced a few years ago, both from Gartner and Harvard Business Review as the biggest predictor, even over NPS, in terms of customer intent to repurchase or expand. That comes from the customer's uh, ease of use the service, how easy it was for them to solve a business problem. And that research is backed by uh, a lot of studies that show that even customers who are happy don't necessarily always go in the right direction. Even customers that adopt, as Ariel was saying, don't always go in the right direction. So my overall theme with this is making sure that you've got balanced metrics, metrics that are tension metrics, so that you can verify false flags, for example, and validate over time and correct as you need. Yeah, it's really interesting you mentioned the customer effort score. So there's a great book that details what that is and how to build it called The Effortless Experience, which is, um, I'm sure you've read that. Um, and there was a Harvard Business Review article by the same authors before that called Stop Trying to Delight Your Customers. Highly recommend both the article and the book to anybody. I'm glad you brought that up, Derek. I always have leaders like directors that roll up into me, read The Effortless Experience. I think it's one of the best books for customer success and customer support. Definitely worth measuring customer effort, no question. So I'm going to add something to this that I think is super important that is is um is often overlooked and undervalued and I want to I want you guys to tell me whether you think this is is makes sense or if I'm I'm blowing smoke but I I actually think that um metrics focused on uh the customer life cycle and specifically your people actually, de you know, delivering what needs to be delivered, ensuring that the right people are doing the right ways, or doing the right things in the right ways at the right times. I don't think there's enough of that. Not only does that give us a sense of, okay, are we, are we as a vendor doing the things that need to be done, right, in order to help the customer achieve value, it, it also shows, are, is the customer doing the things that need to get done in order to achieve value? And it gives us an opportunity to compare and contrast if we're doing it right. You know, how, how is Derek delivering success versus how is Ariel delivering success? And are there things that we can learn that we can cross train? Because for some reason, Derek is getting stuff done in five days. It's taking Ariel 10 days and he's got higher customer SAT score. Yeah, you know, there's an element of this, I think, that uh, begs the question of proactivity, too. You know, so the things that you can measure typically are lagging, which oftentimes are too late. We really need to have more leading metrics to balance those. And one of the things that I would say is most critical, especially for, for individual uh, performance indicators, are the proactive ones. So outreach, anticipating problems, there are loads of things you can do around that. If we see repetitive uh, habits of customers over time, if a customer has problem X, they typically will have problem Y. We know these things, we can learn from them, we can build playbooks, and then we can measure how effective those are over time. That again has an effect on the customer effort score. But those are also individual contributions by each customer success professional that can be shared and can be learned from across the whole team. Ariel, anything to add? Yeah, I would just say that we want to have consistent onboarding of CS professionals too. And I think that's why things like the trainings that you offer, for example, are really helpful. So people are doing the same things. I think when you train and onboard people the same way, you have playbooks like Derek just touched on, you're not going to have as much of it takes Andrew five days, but it takes me 20 days to do it right. You would hope not. <laughs> you would hope not. But 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 the, the key there, though, is knowing that that's a problem so that, you know, if if you do see that, you can do something about it, right? right? So how do you convince other departments and upper management of the value of the KPIs that you've 
uh, that you've selected to make part, you know, to make part of how you're monitoring the business? I'll take that. I think it's a, you know, super question. It, it, you know, it speaks to the value of customer success as a function a little bit. So that's where you tend to, you know, worry a bit too much about promoting the, the vanity metrics. I mean, you, you really have to uh, do, I think, a multi-pronged, I'll we'll call it promotion, but you have to in a certain way. So clearly, there's a lot of industry research out there that shows what are the most effective and starting with that is kind of your, your book of metrics. But in relation to your industry and the product and or service you sell, there are some specific. And if your features are the most important part of your, uh, oh, sorry, did I lose my connection? Are we still good? Yeah, yeah, we're still good. I see an unstable message. Yeah, no, you're doing a little, you're, you're cutting in and out, but we're, 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 we're getting it. Thank you. And so, and so I think that there's a, you know, an aspect of individuality with each customer uh, as well. And so, I, you know, I think getting that right book of KPIs in front of the leadership team uh, to start with is important, but I'm going to come back to, it's not, it's not completely a science. Uh, I'm sure that I'm, I'm going to take more of an artful view of this than you all are thinking, but I do think that it is iterative over time to get to the right ones and they have to be proven for your, each individual use. So again, building a process around this that subjects customer success metrics to continual improvement is critically important to make sure you're moving in the right direction. I, I think it when you try to convince, so in my situation, I've all, almost always come in and taken over existing customer success departments. And there's usually a lot of skepticism from other teams about the efficacy of the CS department. Are they really contributing anything to gross and net revenue retention? So this is a really interesting question. So how do you build that trust again? And I think what Derek was saying, I agree with that. It has to be an iterative process. You have to be able to show the correlation between customer success and revenue growth in particular. I think you know, that's why you don't want NPS and such to be your, your metric, why it's a vanity metric. So um, having things like uh, not quotas, but tracking the number of leads that a customer success manager is passing on to an account management team, for example, and what percentage of those are closing, that's actually very important to track. And I would even go further to say that it's important to comp those customer success managers on the closed deals that they're sourcing. So typically on teams that I've run, about 50% of the deals, closed deals, have come out of customer success, and that's driven revenue growth. So you've got to be able to track back to something commercial, right? Yeah, and you, so you, you, you basically you need to use data to show the data. You yeah. need to use data to prove the data. And, and you also have to have a narrative around, uh, you know, what causation versus correlation, right? Um, and, and be able to, when you can walk in and you can say, Hey, this KPI, we have been able to determine that this KPI that we're using right now is connected to X is connected to this other thing, this thing that we want to have an effect on and be able to show the data that, you know, that, that, that justifies that connection. That makes it, that makes it a lot easier to convince other departments and upper management, especially when you talk about financial stuff, when you talk about revenue, you know, being able to have a good story to tell the CEO, the CFO, uh, uh, goes a long way. Yeah, it totally does. And I think that's the balance between granularity and influence. Yeah. You really want to try to reach that fine point of what is it I am mostly contributing to that I can point to and say this, you know, this is what that outcome uh, was influenced by. Uh, but at the same time, not so granular that it's, you know, you can't really trend it well. So, so the time period is important here too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. So, I mean, one of the things that you've just got to do, and I, I don't agree with making customer success managers, quota carrying account managers, right? I, I am actually, I used to be on the other side of this, but now I don't believe that that's the right thing to do, but you do need to demonstrate the commercial impact of customer success. And the way to do that is to track the number of deals being sourced out of CS. I think that's probably one of the most important CS metrics to track because it really ties back to 
um, your net revenue retention. And you can prove that you're having an impact on it. If you don't track that, you're just guessing, right? You know, how do you know that that net revenue retention is good because of customer success? You know, you, you, you don't, you can't tell. Well, I, I agree with you in that principle. The first thing you said, I disagree with you on. I actually think customer success managers should have some sort of number. Um, and, and but but that's that's a whole separate. We do a whole separate webinar just on that. <laughs> well, so the number. You, so, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the number that they should have is like deal sourced. Uh, you know, I don't I don't want them to be quota carrying like salespeople. I, in my experience, anyway, it's better to have an account management team and a customer success team that are both working hand in hand. That that I agree with you on. But I also think that customer success managers need to be responsible for a book of business, right? And that book of business is attached to a number. And and the things that they do, right? The 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 you know, I I this is so top of mind to me because I, I'm I'm in the process of refreshing our level two content. And as both of you know, having gone through the content in level two, we have a course on on uh, uh revenue on retention and then another course on on expansion, right? And and, uh, and and a big part of retaining customers and expanding is all about customer success. It's all about managing the customer life cycle. So, you know, in my mind, yeah, you are responsible for a number. You're responsible for your book of business, right? You're responsible for ensuring that the customer is getting value and that, and that all the things, all the people are doing the right things in the right ways at the right times. So that the customer gets value. So there is responsibility there. Now, do you call it quota? Do you call it commission? You know, I don't I don't think that's a bad thing, but but and this requires management to actually manage their teams, you know, they can't be type A salespeople either, right? Because we need to manage the balance between uh between um uh, driving revenue and maintaining that trusted advisor relationship. Interestingly enough, next week in our CSM mastermind, and I've just started posting about it this week, um, we're going to be talking about CSMs as the revenue, uh, as a revenue driver. But uh, just a reminder before we go on, um, uh, I do see some questions popping up in the Q&A. Uh, we, we will take questions here probably another 10, 15 minutes. And just a reminder, we go until quarter past the hour. So if you can stick around, we will answer questions as long as uh, as we can, as many questions as possible. So my next question for you guys is, um, have, you, have you ever had a time when you had to make a tough decision to deprioritize a feel-good metric uh, in favor of one that more closely linked to revenue or growth? Yeah, I mean, I've I've encountered this in every CS team that I've ever taken over. This has been, you know, the story of my life, and it's usually something like NPS. NPS, I mean, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I mean, it's these leaders, these CEOs are focused on this, and I don't know why, because the research shows, uh, you know, exactly the opposite. But that's you know, it takes a lot of convincing, and I actually show the research to my leadership when. I take a new position just because, you know, people don't believe it if you just tell them, but if you show them the data behind it, you know, they'll, they'll buy into it. What about yeah, you? I think that, that's a really important one. NPS was going to be uh, top of mind for me as well. You know, that NPS in itself, I don't want to pick on this one too much, wasn't nature of the question, but I think it's, it's a good measure as long as it's balanced with something. Again, you have to balance the transactional with the relationship with the relationship uh, based metrics as well. And so NPS, you know, the, the issue you have with NPS is, or any metric is, if you've got a bad score, what are you going to do with that? Inf anything actionable that comes from a bad NPS score? There isn't. You still have to go back and find out what the reason was for the score. So things like customer effort scoring and some of the other metrics we'll probably get to talk about will actually give you a little bit more direction and focus on what you can do to solve that problem. Well, and this goes back to my original statement around the importance of of measuring stuff that's happening further up, uh, you know, the pipe in the in the in the customer lifecycle. Because, like you said, you know, NPS, customer sat, even renewal and retention, these are the results, right? right? What's I don't want you know the, the story's been written, 
right? The data has been compiled that shows, okay, this is where they're at. Well, what we really should be doing is be focusing on the things that have an effect on those results. Right. And while we do need to measure retention, we need to measure upsell of revenue, and we need to measure, we should be measuring NPS to an extent just to get a gauge of what's happening. Right. What we should be really focused on, which would be more important to us, is what are the things that we're doing that are going to have an effect on those trailing indicators? Yep, great point. So how do you set, and this was always something that I, you know, had to consider every time, you know, in all of my my roles as a leader, how do you set ambitious but achievable targets for your for your KPIs? Do you, do you have a, do you just spitball it? Do you, do you actually do some sort of analysis? Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you are you, you, you know, I, I mean, I, I personally was very conservative to start. Um, uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to press my people too too hard, as we were, especially with the new KPIs we were getting started. What what do what do you guys? What's your experience? So, so I like, go, ahead, go ahead. Go oh. <laughs> ahead. Okay, I was just going to say that you know I spitball it at first, and then I refine it over time. So you know spitball it just based on experience. Um, you know I think you kind of have to do that, and then where the data takes you is where it takes you. Yeah, I think there's an element of uh, providing some certainty over time as well. I mean, if you're continually moving the goalposts with your KPIs, then you can lose a little bit of credibility even with your own team. So the approach I like to take is to set pretty, you know, pretty aspirational objectives and KPIs, but then provide a wide band of acceptance. And then over time, you can tighten that band of accept acceptance up and even apply accelerators to that band based on your, you know, the experiential aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Refine it as you go. And, and this also historical data, if you have historical data, can be incredibly historical data paired up with a data scientist, you know, or somebody who dabbles in data science, even, you know, somebody who knows how to build, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pivot tables and stuff like that in Excel could be, could, could qualify. Sure. Uh, but being able to look at a, 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 a a bunch of historical data and make some assumptions based off what you're seeing. Right. I, I used to give, you know, 18 months, two years of data to somebody who knew how to, uh, how to, how to manipulate Excel really well and say, okay, go take all this stuff. And there's no reason why you can't, you, 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 you can't have lots of data about your customers these days. Storage is cheap, right? Take all this data about our customers and just play with it. See what you can come up with. Do you see any patterns? Do you see any, you know, correlations between, between this and, you know, is, is there a, is, you know, is there, there, there's something in this data that says, Hey, based off of what I'm seeing here, based off of these, these things that are happening, these customers are more likely to stick around. What, uh, uh, speaking of, of, of Excel and data scientists, what role does technology play in your ability to track and analyze your KPIs effectively? Do you have to have like a, oh. a Tableau or a business objects or whatever the, the analytics package to do du jour is? Can you get away with, uh, you know, with Excel and, and, and Google sheets to start with? I mean, what, what's been your experience experience, Derek, you're. Yeah. You're, my, my like passion to answer to that is do not let technology either frustrate you or paralyze you get, get this going sooner than later. Love that. I run uh, metrics programs from spreadsheets just as successfully as from within Qualtrics, right? So it really depends as well on your customer base. If you've got 200 customers or 200,000 customers, then you might have a different response to that. Yeah, exactly. Right? But just, you know, my message is don't, don't get overwhelmed in trying to make some piece of technology fit for purpose because you'll be a year away from getting this stuff out the door. And by then it could be too late for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Aria, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty technology neutral. I would say that none of the existing CS systems, and I've used several of them, will be able to track all of your KPIs, at least not very easily. So, you know, like I was talking earlier, one of the KPIs that I like to track is customer results. And I like to track that down to the individual contributor level. So what percentage of your customer results are good? What percentage are uh, neutral or, or exceed, I'm sorry, what percentage are exceeding, what percentage are good, and what percentage are not good. Um, 
you can't do that in any of the customer success systems. It, it doesn't exist. So what I typically do is I put success plans or I have my team put success plans using the success hacker, hacker template into PowerPoints, and then I have them self-report on you know, what, their, what their outcomes look like. If somebody has a better way of doing it, I'd love to hear it, but that, that's how I've been doing it. Yeah, at least it gives you something. So we talked about evolving your KPIs uh, uh, as as you learn more. Ha have you been in a situation where you've had to evolve your KPIs as your company's priorities have shifted? Uh, oh, sure. I think, you know, again, stepping into a role where perhaps there are already existing metrics based on, say, you know, service desk quality of service, uh, product CSAT scores, those sorts of things. You know, I think those are great, but they're constituents of an overall picture of intent. And so continuing to move those in the right direction is important. Um, Reevaluating in the case, for example, where there's brand new features that come out, maybe there are some abilities to monitor that feature utilization, um, things that are, you know, considered strategic differentiators for your product or service. You might want to tap into that again of themselves, not leading indicators of any intent necessarily, but building an overall picture of how well as a company meeting the needs of your customer, removing the barriers, being proactive, giving them the features that they're asking for. And so those are the sorts of things evolve over time as the product mm -hmm. evolves, but even as the organization maybe changes from, you know, maybe you're a service organization that has a product now, or a product that built a service around it, those sorts of metrics have to change over time as well. So you know, it becomes a, a satisfaction indicator probably around the product and utilization, but also with the ROI given by the expert service that you're delivering to enable that customer to. Yeah, I had an interesting one at one company that I went to where one of the metrics that they had was number of support tickets open per customer. And they wanted that number to be low. And they were tracking that down to the individual contributor CSMs. But when I actually started studying it, I found that the co correlation was actually the opposite of what they thought it was. So the customers that were staying longer actually had more support tickets open than the customers who had fewer support tickets open. So we had to evolve, you know, as a, as a result of that out of the data. It's an interesting one. I, I, I'll chime in on that one, too, to say. Um, you know, there's there's actually probably a right number of support tickets and a right number of category of support tickets that indicate customer engagement with your product. So if you're not getting support tickets, it's not necessarily a good thing. But if you're getting a few and they're not priority one, priority zero tickets, that's also good. And so, you know, finding the balance that's right for you to measure and setting that aspirational target is really important. Yeah, that's a great call out. I've I've been in situations uh, where you know back when we were doing a lot of consulting work, um, and even before when I was an operational leader, where you know there was this discussion about okay, well, what's the right number of support tickets, right? If we have too many, does that mean our our stuff we're not doing a good job training our customers, driving adoption, our product sucks? If we have too few, does that mean that they're not engaged, they don't care? There, you know, we we did a bad job during the onboarding, whatever, you know. So it's it's uh, that that's a that's a very very valid point, uh, and and there's and there's no, you know, dummies guide for that. You got to figure that. Right. You got to figure that out. All right. So one last question I have before uh, we get to the questions in the Q and A, and uh, just a reminder, I know Ariel, you you went ahead and 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 clicked on the answer live. So Derek, if you want to take a look and see if there's anything there that you want to jump on as well. Um, so we talked about, we talked about revenue. And like I said, we're going to talk more about revenue uh, uh, next week in the CSM mastermind, but some might argue that focusing too heavily on revenue oriented KPIs could lead to short-term thinking and potentially damage long-term customer relationships. So how, how would you respond to that concern. And I touched on it a little bit earlier. Yeah, I can, I can take that. I think it still needs to be balanced. I mean, it seems like the key word here, right? But if you're not demonstrating contribution to revenue, 
then you will be seen as a cost center and your value will be called into question over time. Yeah. And how many of us on this call have started off perhaps in other jobs uh, where we were customer success managers and by the end of our tenure there, we are now project managers or account managers or TAMs or something other. And so you still have to show that value. Uh, but the difference in mean, carrying the sales quota is that you don't structure it in a way where you are creating the opportunity for bad actors, right? So, so there's potential upside, you know, based on the right motions of customer success. And, and it, it really should be a kind of a services outcome or sorry, a sales a services motion with a sales outcome, as we say, um, so that you don't lose the sense of advocacy, which is what customer success was created for in the first place. If that makes sense. I mean, okay. there's a, you know, the, probably a whole hour on that topic alone and how to oh, compensate right. customer success folks and yes. particularly in relation to metrics. Right. But, but again, I think you, you can't, you can't avoid it. And if you do, it's at your peril. It, it has to be attached to some sort of business contribution. hundred percent. Yeah. You know what, Ashley, let's add that to the list of future CSLRs. I think that that's a, I, I think that's, that's something that we, we, we need to talk about. Uh, Ariel, what do you got? Yeah, so I would say I, I just, I mean, I agree with what Derek just said. I, I think you and I, Andrew, were kind of saying the same thing too. I just, I don't think that the customer success manager should be the one closing deals with a client because I think it takes them out of that, 100%. Uh, that advisor role. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What, what I do think they should be doing though is identifying deals that somebody like an account manager or somebody back in the sales team, if it's a smaller company, is going to close and we should make that a KPI in some way for the CSM. So whether it's like, I like to do it by uh, number of deals closed uh, and also comp the CSM based on those closed deals, like give them a commission. Um, you could do it on revenue, directly on revenue, but then it gets dangerously quote, close to giving them quotas. And all I would say to that is that some CSMs are going to be much better at finding those commercial opportunities than other ones. So I like to make it, and this is just me personally, but I like to make it an optional activity for CSMs. The ones that are good at it are going to naturally gravitate to it. When you put a financial reward on top of it, it's going to accelerate it. And the ones that aren't as good at it are still going to find some opportunities, but they're not under pressure to, to necessarily hit a number. So, and like I said, just doing that, I've typically had 50 plus percent of the total upsell, cross-sell revenue sourced out of CS without having to put quotas on it. Which um, is great. That's awesome. Yeah, I'd like to add one more thought to that because I don't think something we've talked about yet on this call is churn, right? We're talking about growth. We're talking about, you know, business being being prosperous, but at the same time, customer success was founded because there was a churn problem that nobody was paying attention to. Everyone was focused on NDR. As long as we were, you know, we were, uh, you know, we were acquiring more than we were losing, we were doing fine until something happened with the economy, then oops, you know, so there's a great value. I think if you're a hundred million dollar company, of course, in attaching some aspect of growth to your CSM so that the next 10 million has some kind of action or, or motion against it. But don't forget, your customer success department is defending $100 million in revenue. And that needs attention. It needs its own set of metrics, set of incentives. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. I think you actually have to track gross and net revenue retention as the ultimate KPI down to the individual contributor level. So, you know, as a VP, I have some directors rolling up into me. I'm looking at their team numbers for gross and net revenue retention, but then I'm looking at each individual CSM's gross and net revenue retention numbers, and I'm bonusing them on hitting certain targets. And at the end of the day, it's like, like you said, uh, Ariel, I agree with you that, and, and I believe Derek did too, that a customer success manager shouldn't necessarily be, uh, be negotiating the terms right? And closing the deal. But the customer success response, ultimate responsibility is creating the environment for a renewal or an expansion to occur. That's our job. And, and to your point, Derek, um, a, 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 a well running CS organization is going to have a number that quickly outpaces new revenue. 
right? So why wouldn't you want to, however, in whatever format it makes the most sense, why wouldn't you want to own a number? I That's want to own a hundred million dollar sustainable revenue number. Right. How much leverage does that give me as a leader to get the things that 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 we need to to make the changes that need to be changed? Hey, I got a hundred million dollars that says we need to expand the product this way, not this other way that you have one a handful of prospects that are saying they want this functionality in the product. Exactly. So we need to prioritize our existing customers over the prospects because those existing customers are existing. They are going to have, by selling them more, that is going to have a positive impact on our EBITDA, right? It's going to have a positive impact on the financial health of the organization, far greater than what a couple of new prospects are going to bring us. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Let's take some questions. All right. So once again, we're going to go based off of most upvotes. So if you see a question on this list, um, folks, and uh, you want to see it answered before you leave at 12, or you just want to see it answered and, you know, during this, uh, during the time that we have, uh, please upvote it. So our first question comes from anonymous attendee. We get anonymous, we got a bunch of anonymous attendees. Uh, at every one of these things. How do you recommend measuring customer results for the digital-led segment? And Aria, looks like you want to jump in on this right out of the gate. So what have you got for anonymous attendee? Yeah, boy, it's really tough. I mean, when you have like a one-to-many relationship with uh, with your customers, you know, like one CSM per 100 clients, it's very difficult to do that. You're not going to do success plans with all of them. So I think you have to be strategic and find those customers that you think are more likely to grow and do the success plans with them. So, you know, identifying those potential growth clients in your your tech touch segment is critical. I can tell you like one time when I worked at Experian, we had Starbucks was one of our clients, but they were only like $14,000 ARR, but I guarantee you we treated them like an enterprise client. You know? Yeah, that's a great point. I, and, uh, you know, the, the key word there is segment, segment, segment. That's how you deal with it. You know, where do you see the greatest potential? Apply the most effort there. I, I think you need to, tip. personally, I think you need to take a hard look at your product offering and figure out, okay, well, the first, first question is, okay, why are people buying? Why are people coming to us? Is there a particular part of our offering uh, that is is more valuable than others? And one of the ways of doing that, even if if it's a digital led segment, is doing some doing some homework, going and 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 surveying those folks, picking up the phone and calling a few of them. Um, make sure it's a kind of a a, a good cross section of the folks in your digital led segment. But uh, I I've been in situations where we've you know we've analyzed that sort of uh, that sort of group, and we've come up with uh, you know a set of functionality that ever, I'm signing up for this. Right. So if if they're signing up for this, then, you know, one way of measuring customer results is how much are they using this feature? We know that they get value out of this feature, this set of features. All right. So that's a pretty good indicator. Once again, these these metrics are not going to be 100 percent dead on. Right. But we they should be able to give us a sense. Hey, this is, you know, if are we trending in the right direction or do we have. Yeah. Um. Awesome. Thank you, anonymous attendee Ariel. If you could hit done on that, I would appreciate that. Uh, we got another question from anonymous attendee. Uh, customer effort score is typically a question around how easy is this product feature to use. Do you recommend different verbiage? I do. Okay. I do. The the intent of that question is about the customer's perception of value. Again, that question, the way it's phrased, is very much internally focused. We want to understand something about how our product is being used. We really want to focus on is, did the customer receive the value that they intended? So if the question is phrased, how easy was it for you to solve your business problem with our product or service? That takes the customer viewpoint and it still gives us the valuable information about their intent. And that's how I would phrase that. Okay, good. Yep. 
You got anything to add to that, Mario? I would just say that's exactly how I've done it as well. That's the absolute best way to do it. Awesome. Matt, Matt, thanks for joining us. Matt asks, do each of you have a favorite leading indicator? So much of what we see in CS is lagging. Okay. <laughs> you want to jump in on this, Ariel? Well, I think when you think of our most CS organizations think that their health score is a leading indicator, right? And it becomes a KPI, like let's get X number of clients in the green or whatever. Um, it's definitely not a leading indicator. I can almost guarantee you that it's a lagging and probably in most cases, severely lagging indicator. But what I will tell you works really well is when you combine a customer health score with customer maturity modeling. So um, there's, a, there's a great article called Your Customer Health Score May Be Quite Useless by Boaz Mayor. Boaz, yes. Yeah. That's a great, art, great, great article. Boaz really knows, knows his stuff when it comes yeah. to that. Yeah, really knows his stuff. So he came up with this maturity modeling system. And basically, without getting into the details of it, because we don't have a lot of time to do that, but puts customers in a grid. So you've got four squares in the grid. And it shows you which customers are mo most likely to grow and be open to cross-sell, upsell, which customers are likely to just kind of keep jugging, chugging along, which customers you should go out and save, and then which customers you should probably let churn because they're a bad fit customer. Highly recommend that to, to everybody. I always combine the customer maturity index with a health score, and that's the most proactive, or the, most, um, the best way to make your CS team proactive. Uh, by the way, folks, I dropped Boaz's uh, LinkedIn profile into chat. I would follow him. Uh, he's uh, He doesn't post a whole lot, but when he does, uh, it's uh, usually something meaningful. So check him out. Derek, you got, the, you got one? Yeah, I'll, I'll come in behind that and say, look, I, I mean, I've said customer effort score a number of times. I can't say it enough. I think it's really important. But the, the other one I wanted to touch on was something that I like to measure called executive buyer outreach. So here's what happens in a typical customer success situation. An executive buyer or an economic buyer, as we say, purchases the product or service, and then you end up getting relegated to a project management team or some technical team. And then now you've got three agendas that often aren't aligned. So you've got this traditional sort of PMO triangle that you need to flatten out. So it's incumbent upon the CSM to make sure that they're reaching back to the executive buyer, not just for status, but to make sure that if, you know, value has changed, the goalposts have changed, that we're also acting as the internal change agent with the customer and reframing that with the handling team as well. So that number, I think, is really important. And it can be whatever is relevant to your environment, your customer, your product. But knowing that your CSMs uh, are engaged at the economic buyer level, I think, is critically important. If you look around, a lot of us are. And that is because we, we tend um sort of take the 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 uh the side seat to or you know the executive uh on the account that does that but it's super important because again you know you can get drift internally within a customer in terms of objectives and you need to be the person that that corrects that course you got to corral it you got to make sure everybody's on the same page yeah i got one thing to add uh before we go on to the next question of matt um Matt, my my uh, my favorite leading indicators, and I'm going to say indicators because it could be multiple ones. I already touched on this on the customer lifecycle. What are the what is the main thing, or what are those few things that we need to get done right that help us move closer to value, right? That help us get fast time to value. Is that is that a is that a, something that has to do with the implementation? Is it a demo that needs to be done to the key stakeholders? Is it a a training? that helps uh, solidify adoption, you know, they're, 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 you know, what, what are those things that earlier on in the customer journey, right? During that onboarding phase, I want to measure those things, right? I want to see, because that ultimately is going to have uh, the biggest impact on us having, you know, the biggest impact on those, on those trailing indicators, like, like uh, NPS and churn and renewals and, and stuff like that. Um. All right, our next question comes from Angela. Angela, good to see you. Been been a minute. Uh, Angela asks, when you mentioned comp for CS based on closed deals they are sourcing, was there any pushback from leadership on this type of comp for CS? And Ariel, what do you got? 
Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So what I did when there was pushback, so at one company I was at, I actually went to leadership and I asked, can we start giving the CS folks a commission for deals that closed that they were, uh, that they sourced? And the answer was no, absolutely not. So what I started to do after that was track it. So I tracked it in Salesforce and um, put, so what I did to motivate the CSMs was create a competition. So they're trying to hit the leaderboard, they get a gift card, et cetera. But through tracking it in Salesforce, we found that 57% of the closed deals were sourced out of customer success. Once I had that data, it was very easy to go back to leadership and say, hey, look at what's going on here. Maybe we should be comping these folks to drive it even higher. And the answer was yes. Love and it did, it did drive it higher, by the way, when they were getting comped for it. Yeah, CSQLs. And you can okay. comp people without turning them into salespeople. Once again, there's sure. a balance, right? We don't want to lose the trusted advisor relationship, but we also want to, we, we want to, um, reward them, right? Part of this is just doing your job, right? Part of this is, hey, you know what? Table stakes are, you are here to create an environment for renewal. Um, it's it's those, those uh, especially in those upsells, those expansions is where I'm really like, yeah, we've got to gotta provide something there too because they're going above and beyond. So, um, Derek, you got anything to add? No, I agree with all of that. Uh, I think, you know, the best way to approach that is, is again, uh, create some upside potential, but make sure it's tied to the right things that, you know, uh, reinforce the right behaviors. We always need to maintain a level of customer advocacy in this role. 100%. Um, another anonymous attendee uh, asks, uh, can you discuss a little more about why churn is a vanity metric? Our team is being held very close to our churn rate, though we do not necessarily have control over the metric itself. Did All we right. call it that? I don't think I called it that. Did I? So Andrew well, we did. Them, it's, it's a trailing indicator. It, the, the vanity metrics are really more like NPS and, and yeah. retention. It's just churn is kind of negative to retention. Yeah. But Aria, what do you got? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a vanity metric either. I mean, you mentioned it in your opening, which is, I think, where the, the question was coming from. Uh, the one thing I would push back, anonymous attendee, is saying that you don't necessarily have control over the metric. You actually have quite a bit of control over the metric. I mean, that's the, the essence of customer success. Like I said at the beginning, if you're measuring customer results, they're going to stay longer. We know that that's true from the research. If they're getting good results, they're going to stay a lot longer. We know that that's true from the research. So who has the most control over whether customers are receiving results from a solution, it's the customer success team. So we absolutely have control over, uh, over churn. But yeah, I think you have to look at gross revenue retention as well as, as expansion revenue. I mean, gross revenue retention is maybe even the more important metric if it's low. And by low, I mean less than like 94%, you know, you're selling out of a hole at that point and your net revenue retention is gonna suffer among other things. Plus just for valuation of a company, every point of gross revenue retention is huge. So that's my two cents there. Eric, you got anything to add? Well, the risk of repeating myself, I turn to me is critically, critically important. It's the reason why customer success was established in the first place was because focus over, or hyper-focus on NDR can lead to bad things during bad economic times and that growth dries up. And then you realize that you're losing faster than you're winning. You can't take your eye off that. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it's really important to, to be measured on that. Uh, it is not the only thing to be measured on as we're talking about here today, but, but churn is something that is directly influenced by the actions of customer success. And, uh, you know, perhaps anonymous attendee, if, if you're feeling like that's not the case for you, then perhaps it's got more to do with the level of autonomy you're not provided to do your job. I think as a function, CS has that as, a, as really as a core remit. Awesome. Um, our next question comes from Mike. Mike, good to see you. Mike asks, should we have different KPIs for each destination within the customer lifecycle? I, I think, uh, um, uh, Mike, I'm, I'm just to clarify, you, it, it, these, these different 
uh, milestones in in the life cycle. I assume is what you're. Yes. Okay. That's what he's he's getting at. So we have to. So so based off of where the customer is in the journey, uh, are we gonna? Are, do you have a? Do you make adjustments? Do you have different KPIs that you look at? I think that there are some KPIs that are, you know, perhaps, well, yes, is the answer to the question, but how they, how they influence the overall performance judgment on customer success and the customer intent varies. So of course you're measuring how long it takes to get a customer to production and a customer to value, right? That statement that says job well done, you know, I've got what I needed from this. Um, but then also the expansion and, you know, onwards throughout the life cycle. So these are all things that you're measuring over time, but really, you know, some of them again are leading and what we really want to get to is have they been a customer for a long time? So customer lifetime value, are they expanding? Are they repurchasing? Are they renewing? You know, those are the ultimate metrics really, and everything should point in that direction. Um, but the way you asked your question, the answer from me is yes. Yeah, as I mentioned before, like you're going to have different KPIs that you look at in the onboarding phase than in that kind of steady state phase. Uh, so, you know, and you're going to have, you know, different leading indicators, for example, in the onboarding phase to ensure that the customer is on the path to value realization. And right. once they've achieved that value, right, they're going to, there's a, there's a different set of, of indicators that you're going to, that you're going to look at. Harley, you got anything to add? No. Awesome. Mike, thanks for the question. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Bailey asks, should KPIs be solely measured on churn percentage? Oh, no. no. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that's not your world, Bailey. Yeah. <laughs> that's a world of hurt. Yeah. I mean, totally. I mean, it's, it's an important thing, of course, right? Because that is one of the major contributions to the business health that we have. But if it's the thing you're being measured on, then um, I think, you know, there needs to be some readjustment in the perception of what CS does. I'll, I mean, they, so I'll leave it at that. Ba well, Bailey, I, says, Bailey says, ah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know that I agree with that, actually. Um, I mean, ultimately, we're looking or we're measuring customer success by gross and net revenue retention. I mean, that's the ultimate KPI that the leader should be held to. And any KPIs that we have should be in service of customer longevity. So I don't know. I have a little bit of a different view there. Well, I mean, she's she asked in the question, should KPIs be solely measured right. on churn percent? I mean, it definitely needs to be. I think every customer success team needs to be measured on churn and retention. That's those Absolutely. are those are our table stakes. Right, but they that those need to be complemented by a bunch of other stuff. They need to include other things. Yeah, okay. definitely include other things. But the ultimate goal of any metric should be in the service of retention. Sure, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and I think Bailey needs a sticker to brighten her day. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, just reach out to me on on LinkedIn, Bailey. I'll send you. I'll send you a sticker. To, uh, to brighten your day. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for the question. Uh, let's see. Next question, uh, Victoria. Victoria, thank you for joining us. Victoria asks, as Andrew touched on goal setting, is there a methodology that you would recommend for that? Anybody? Any particular methodology that you that you use? I'm trying to wrap my head around the question a little bit. Yeah. I think, I think Victoria, I think a, a part of it, if I understand your question, um, I, I think, I think it, there's nothing complicated about this. I think you need to, to like, like Derek actually mentioned is, uh, you know, un understand, first of all, what's your, what's your, what, what is your, your, your objective? What are you trying to, you know, why, why are you measuring this? What are you trying to achieve from it? The other thing that Derek mentioned as well is, uh, what are you going to do? with that information. Um, right. So make sure it's what, whatever the, uh, uh, the, the KPIs are that you're, you're looking at for goals, make sure that they're actionable, that you can do something with them. Um, and, um, 
and then just start playing start playing with the numbers like i think you mentioned derek have a have a really wide kind of uh fight yeah. for that you know how 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 you know and and then refine that as you go i'll i'll say that again you know set the targets aspirationally so that people understand where we need to get to but give them a band to start with that tightens over time so that yeah. you know the achievability becomes becomes a little bit uh, more realistic for them but i'll also say one other thing about how you reward these goals as well. I think it's really important that you balance you balance how you're compensating if you know you're compensating this uh, that it's not a short period of time where you can't measure the success of an individual or the team, but also not so long. You know, if the team isn't going to hit their numbers, they realize that early on in that stage, and then they start submarining, and then you don't get the results you want. Right. So that's different for everybody. You have to figure out whether that's quarterly, monthly, weekly, annually. Uh, but it's really important to get the timing right, too. So it's not just about setting the goals. It's about how you achieve and reward those goals, too. Ariel, you got anything to add? No, I'm not going to add anything to that. Okay. I agree. Awesome. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, our next question comes from Gretchen. Gretchen asks, how do you measure that a deal is actually uncovered by CS? I have seen sales reps partner with their CS reps and then have them open uh, all opportunities for existing customers. We we actually, as part of our out, outbound, um, our outcome-based selling um, course, uh, we we use the, the customer success qualified lead, a CSQL uh, concept. Yeah. What, do you, what, do you, what do you do? Yeah, so always track that in Salesforce. So it, in my experience, I've given the CSMs the ability to go into Salesforce and mark the lead as generated from them. It's no different from having a marketing qualified lead to have a customer success qualified lead. I mean, there's going to be a lead source. It comes from somewhere. The sales guy is still going to get his, or the account manager, hopefully not the sales guy, is going to be getting his commission regardless of where it was sourced from. So there really shouldn't be any, any friction there, but. Derek, any, any, any difference in your world? Uh, yeah, a little difference. I mean, I, uh, my team doesn't currently have that opportunity to open those records, but I've been elsewhere where there has been that. And I think it's really important to do. Um, so I really don't have much to add other than to say, you know, if you're in an environment where you're lucky, like I am, where, you know, the, the account team is really a, a tight knit group that includes the customer success manager, then, you know, those things are typically recognized informally, you know, and there's no hesitation with that. Uh, but if you're in a competitive environment with the sales organization, then, you know, you might need to have something that you can point to for sure. Awesome. Thank you for the, uh, thanks for the question. Um, our next question comes from Stephanie, Stephanie asks, do you share KPIs with the customer? Are they set together between the customer and the CSM or are they defined by the CSM without customer input and remain internal facing uh, only? Ariel, you want to jump into this first. What about, what, what, what how do you do things? Yeah, so uh, the one KPI that you do share with the customer is around the results, like I was talking about earlier. So when you create a success plan, that's never something that the CSM should be doing on their own. That should always be jointly done between the customer and the CSM. And then tracking back to those results and tracking uh, whether the result was uh, obtained or the outcome was obtained, was it exceeded, was it not obtained, that actually needs to be shared with the customer. There needs to be agreement between the customer and, and the vendor that that happens. So that is the one that I would obviously share with clients, but the other ones are internal and I would, I would not share them with the clients. What about you, Derek? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Uh, some are worth sharing. Some are not. Uh, but I would also add to that. Most customers enjoy seeing how they perform against their cohorts. Right. And it, it's important to cohort them uh, into a segment that makes sense so that you're not misleading. But I think, you know, if a customer wants to understand how their adoption is compared to their cohort, I think that's, that's an okay thing to show to an economic buyer, for example, to say, look, you know, we're not seeing uh, utilization like you want to see it. We're not seeing it uh, in the way that most of our customers tend to enjoy the value of our product. Let's work together on an adoption plan for you. Love it. 
All right. Our, and we're going to keep going here for another about five minutes. Um, so next question, another one from Anonymous. When you provide commission for CS Leads 1, then inherently you are a selling you are a selling CS organization, right? <laughs> no. Well, no. Yeah. yeah. It depends on what's behind that compensation, right? What what, what are what are the scorings? Like what's what's, you know, again, what, what are people being incented to do? Just because you receive money for doing something that contributes to the overall success of your business doesn't necessarily make you a salesperson. And that's from experience. I think a well-structured team with the right set of KPIs that have been defined with the right level of autonomy to the customer is a very effective customer success organization and should be should be compensated for that and should be compensated well. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the CSM is never the one that's actually going to be doing the selling. They're just uncovering an opportunity that hopefully an account management team is then going in and closing a deal on. So yeah, I would you know never encourage anybody to have the CSM close deals they're usually not good at it and if they are they're probably in the wrong role anyway so um yeah so i don't think you'd be a selling cs org even though you're you're sourcing leads for a selling org it can feel that way i'll say if you're not used to it and you come into the environment and suddenly you've got you know the pseudo quota attached it can feel like you're being incented to do the wrong things but that's not necessarily true look at how you're being assessed that's what's really important to make sure that again it's the right motions that are happening that contributed to customer advocacy and that sets the stage for growth so you have a critical role to play in that and that's that's part of the overall process and life cycle of the customer yeah this is why i never give the individual contributor csm a quota towards this and i kind of just let the ones that are good at it naturally gravitate towards it and do it and the ones that aren't as good at it i don't put the pressure on them so much to do it um, although everybody gets incentivized through some commissions, ultimately the quota is on me as the leader and maybe the directors under me. So, yeah, so the organization needs a number, right? That doesn't necessarily mean, once again, to your point, that every CSM has a number, but you as the leader, I think, need to own a number. Yeah. You need to own a number and then you need to, to, to manage and coach your team on helping achieve that and giving them what they need to help achieve that. I wonder how many people on the call, because I felt this, you know, during the, the course of my career as a customer success person, feel uncomfortable because we came in at a time when CS was seen as this altruistic role. We'll only ever do what's right for the customer. You know, there's no selling involved. There's no quota involved. And then, you know, people started to realize y'all are costing a lot of money. <laughs> you know, they're of contribution. And uh, it was a bit of an attitude adjustment I had to make during the course of my career as well as that role evolved. But, you know, I would say don't, don't let it distract you from your values. Don't let it, you know, necessarily mean something to you that it doesn't, you know, take a look at what it is you're able to achieve and influence around you. And I bet it's still the same things. Awesome. Uh, another question here from Lee. Lee asks, can you speak a bit about how you might use the customer effort score in segmenting? Who wants to take that one? In segmenting or a in, in segmentation, I'm assuming. In so, yeah. so, so, I, so how, how you use customer effort score as a as a as a tool, as a data point for segmentation. I assume. As a data point for segmentation. So yeah. for example, Lee, you want to drop you want to drop into in the chat, a little more clarification on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot while you're doing that. So if what you're saying is if we see results that we can correlate to different segments of the customer base, what do we do with that information? Yeah, I don't know. Lee has not responded yet. Well, here's one way you can look at that. So let's take an example of you know, your, your tech touch customers, you know, the, the aspiring group has more, uh, oh, reading comments. So, so say that that's the, the cohort that is scoring the effort high. In other words, it's a lot of effort to, to achieve value. 
well, then you've got a pretty good sense of where to focus, right? So what are the touch points with that customer? Is the CSM even engaged? Is it entirely tech, tech touch? You know, what does that website look like? Is it getting used? Are there other problems? Are the documents there outdated, et cetera, versus if you've got a strategic segment and everyone's happy there, well, there's a really good reason for that. You know, there's a lot of human interaction, probably it's a touch and care. Um, you know, you make determinations, I guess, based on what it is you're doing in those segments and how you can correlate that. Ariel, you got anything to add? No, I think that makes a lot of sense, actually. Okay. Just wondering if we've got... Uh... Here, let's, let's answer one more question here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. David asks for KPIs. Do you use comparative? Do you use comparatives between accounts touched by customer success versus those that aren't? That's a really interesting question. I never thought about doing that, but um, so you don't probably should. No, I yeah. would say no, but probably should be doing that. Great suggestion. What about you, Derek? I think it's a good idea. Uh, I think your organization has to support that making sense. I don't think I'd be anywhere that makes a lot of sense necessarily because, you know, typically you go back to the segmenting question, touched by CS and not touched by CS is typically a segmentation problem or not right. problem, but segmentation cohort. Awesome. All right. Well, we're at the end of our, uh, of the time that we have. Uh, that we've got for today. So I think it was a great conversation, but it's not what I think. It's what all of you think. Uh, please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn and tagging either myself, our guests, or success coaching, or all, all of us. I want to thank our guests for spending the time with us and for the ideas, thoughts, insights, and best practices that you shared. Uh, one final note, great CS leaders know they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. And that's why we created the CS Leadership Roundtable to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. Once again, we hope to see you next month on May 15th when we'll discuss developing lasting relationships with stakeholders. Until then, make sure to make space for yourself and your mindset every single day and have a great rest of your week and month. See you next time.